Chapter 5 Michael, 6.35 p.m. I was glad the place we were going was right next door and that we didn't have to hail a cab or anything like that to get there, because until Gail mentioned it, I hadn't realized just how hungry I was. I'm starving, I repeated, getting up from the table and plucking my jacket from the back of my chair. As we moved out of the cafe and to the escalator, I was reminded of the hunger pangs I'd felt walking into Antonio's urban kitchen yesterday. I had been tantalized by the smell of the food there, but I'd also been tempted by the offer the hot young Beatrice had made. Heck, I'd felt the heat radiating off Beatrice immediately. Her scent and the look she'd given me had resonated immediately in my groin. Yesterday, of course, I didn't enjoy a bite of the delicious meal across from a beautiful young woman. The taste of the food was off and the meal seemed to last forever because I was too nervous about how to politely reject the pretty fan's blatant advances, and every single moment that passed had come with an agonizing desire for me to finish that meal, get out of there, and remove myself from the situation. Completely unlike how I felt tonight. Gail was closer to my age, near pushing forty, and an absolutely stunning beauty. Sure, she was pleasing to the eye, the type of beauty you feel good about just looking at, but what I loved about her was she was dynamic and multi-layered. That made her far more beautiful, far more appealing to me. And though I picked up an intense sexual desire off of Gail within a split second of my first word to her, there was something far deeper at play I could sense. While I could tell from the emotive scent she gave off and how her heartbeat reacted to things I said and did that she was really into me, as into me as I was into her, she thought I was hot. But that's not what appealed to me. That's not what intrigued me. No, it was those layers. It was the fact she kept repressing it, or at least trying to repress it, and hiding that desire behind layers. That was what intrigued me, because it felt like her desire for me was playing peekaboo. The now here and now gone aspect was so bloody appealing, and it drew me into her even further. She was also completely aware of her surroundings while appearing oblivious to them. Though she was subtle about it, I could tell she was aware of the position and actions of everyone in that cafe, and I was curious to know what it was that led her to be. I have enhanced senses. I can hear, see, and smell things the average person isn't aware of. But Gail seemed to have some sort of dynamic ability to perceive the room in a way she very carefully didn't let on to anyone else around her. I'm not even sure she was aware of it. When she'd taken that call from her female friend, I consciously focused on not listening in. I'd been able to hear every word Gail said and every word her friend Isabeau said. It was something about bees and addicts and ruined merchandise, but it was none of my business. I did my best to focus on other noises and sounds around me. If I attend to something specific, I can drown out the other static noises. I tried paying attention to the conversation between an elderly couple at the far side of the bar. They'd been squabbling about the deadbeat boyfriend of their forty-year-old daughter who still lived in their basement. This worked, keeping me from listening in on much of Gail's conversation. Only short snippets of what Gail was saying made it to me, and I did my best to ignore them. But I couldn't ignore two of the things I heard. Five thousand dollars and celibacy. The first one had been uttered by Gail. I wondered if that was the cost of whatever insect incident they'd been speaking about came to. As for celibacy, that had come from Isabeau, and I had no idea what the context was, nor how it related to their beehive mishap. Isabeau was hot for the beekeeper, who was a celibate. I was hot for Gail. I gestured for her to enter the revolving doors exiting the Barnes & Noble first. I took that brief moment to enjoy a quick look at her very fine ass in those tight black leather pants as she moved ahead of me. I had heard the expression, the kind of ass you could bounce a quarter off of, before, but until just then it had never made any sense to me. Tommy Bahama right next door is more known for its seafood, I said when we reconvened together outside on the sidewalk. They have great food, but aren't known for their pasta, and we might not get a table right away without a reservation. That wasn't entirely true. 
I'm sure I would be able to get us in by playing the Mac Halpin card. My literary agent carried a lot of sway in this city, and I had occasionally used it to bypass the regular lines at some establishments. But I didn't want to be showing off. I wanted instead to be using this time to focus on what Gail could teach me about the occult. And if I were to be completely honest, to enjoy focusing on those gorgeous green eyes as long as possible. That was just an expression, she said. Like saying, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse's ass. Her smile quickly morphed into a small round O shape, and I smelled a quick pang of embarrassment. She was worried she'd just been too crude. I laughed, and that put her immediately back at ease. I picked up another whiff of that heat she had for me, so I extended the laugh a little bit longer just for the satisfaction of what that did to her. What do you say we pop over to an Irish pub around the corner? There's no pasta on the menu, but they've got a steak and potato dish that'll knock your socks off. I'm game for some sock knocking, she said, and hooked her right arm out for me to take it. Lead on, Macduff. This rare edition of the short story, History of the Necronomicon, so the legends go, Gail said, was created using anthropodermic bibliopagy. Anthropo-what now? I asked. I'd been listening to her explain numerous theories and legends surrounding H.P. Lovecraft's infamous Necronomicon and the mythology the author had created about a book that never existed except, of course, for the numerous true believers, occultists, pranksters, hoaxers, and conspiracy theorists who continued to perpetuate the idea that the text, allegedly written in Arabic by Abdul Alhazred, was real. Only, Gail explained, while there were libraries of numerous versions of the Necronomicon, not as many as there were interpretations of the King James Bible, but plenty enough, there was something the real collectors would kill for— the special and extremely rare edition of Lovecraft's 700-word short story, History of the Necronomicon. Anthropodermic bibliopagy, she said. The practice of binding books in human skin. Ugh, I replied, disturbed by the topic, but I could not take my eyes off hers. She was an incredibly intense storyteller. I'd been hanging on her every word for the past three quarters of an hour as she had explained the background of Lovecraft's work and the particular fictional text and its history that I needed stories about. I already had a dozen possibilities kicking around in the back of my head for where I could take this mystery I was writing. But Gail was still going strong and had shocked me with this latest revelation. It's an obviously rare form of bookbinding, particularly today, but it was done numerous times throughout history and it dates back to the 13th century, with one of the earliest known examples being a French Bible. What, did people donate their skin for such projects, or was it just done to them? A combination of both. There is a book in the Surgeon's Hall Museum in Edinburgh, bound in the flesh of a man by the name of Burke. He was found guilty of drugging and killing 16 people to sell their bodies to an anatomist. He was executed, and his skin was used to bind a book with the following words embossed on the cover. Burke's Skin Pocketbook. Executed 28 Jan, 1829. Holy crap, I said. I thought I had written macabre things in my mystery novels, but that was something else. That's one heck of a death sentence. Or death sentences, I suppose. I laughed nervously. Gail didn't laugh. Her scent revealed that she hadn't even noticed my vain attempt at stupid humor. She was concentrating on the story she was sharing. Back to that history of the Necronomicon book. It was bound in human skin, but there's one more thing that makes it even more disturbing. Gail paused to slowly lift her glass of Merlot to her lips and take a sip. I didn't dare speak and break the storytelling spell she had me under and I could tell from the scent she exuded that she knew she had me in the palm of her hand. She was enjoying the fact she had me on the edge of my seat. While they're not sure whose blood it is, she began to say as she carefully placed her now empty wine glass back down, blood was used as the ink for this particular and very much sought after handwritten version of the book. Oh my God, that's perfect. I clapped my hands together to enunciate my point. That can be the underlying book behind the murder, while everyone else thinks it's related to a different rare version of the Necronomicon. I rubbed my clasped hands together and sat back for a moment, letting my eyes escape from hers to glance at the ceiling as I stored away a few nuggets of details for the novel. 
Yes, I muttered. Yes, that can work really well. I picked up my beer and took a sip of it. It was warm, having sat untouched for most of the past hour, but I didn't care. Gail's stories had helped fill me with the details I needed to break the block. I could feel the words itching to tumble out of me. This was when I realized I wanted nothing more than to call for the check, pay the tab, and rush back to my room at the Algonquin, where I would write until the wee hours of the morning. Heck, I had enough here to carry me through to the very end of this book. I loved it when it all fell into place. Huh, Gail said as I placed my beer back on the table. So that's what it's like. I turned my eyes and attention back to her. She was now leaning forward and staring at me, the look on her face and the scent coming off her indicating she was absolutely fascinated with what she'd just witnessed. That's what what's like. That creative spark. Inspiration. Whatever it is, I could have sworn I saw the moment it flickered in your eyes. The air changed. You seemed to change. You went from a listener to being engaged in something a million miles away. Did I? Yeah, she said, and her eyes sparkled with excitement. It was such an amazing transformation to observe. You looked almost like you might be having an orgasm. I laughed. That's sometimes exactly how it feels. No kidding. Yeah. Where do your ideas come from? Most of them come from a warehouse in Schenectady. A confused look and feeling overcame her. I laughed. It's an old joke that science fiction writer Harlan Ellison once said in an interview. He was asked where his crazy ideas come from, and he said, Schenectady, there's a warehouse that ships him a pack of ideas for 25 bucks every week. Oh, she said, wrinkling her cute nose. I realized I'd shared an insider writer joke that made no sense to her. So, I said, I got some amazing content that I can really use, but we haven't even ordered yet, and I'm even more famished than before. Because Gail was so busy sharing details and I was so focused on listening, we hadn't looked at our menus. The waiter, who had come by three times to try to take our order, seemed to have given up on us ordering food. We had, however, had a couple of rounds of drinks during that time, or at least Gail had a couple of glasses of Merlot. I had my barely-touched beer and a glass of water. Our waiter noticed Gail's glass was empty and approached the table. We used that time to order some food. I went with the steak and potatoes while Gail ordered the famous Angry Burger. And, she said, I think we should start with a pound of your crispy chicken wings. How hot do they come? Buffalo or sweet and spicy? She looked at me with a defiant look on her face. Can you handle hot and spicy, Andrews? I wasn't a big fan of hot food. Frank's Red Hot was typically more than enough for me, but I wasn't about to look like a wuss. Sure, I said, the hotter the better. You've got nothing hotter than buffalo? Gail asked the waiter. No, but I can put in a special request with the chef. You do that, she said. Tell him he's dealing with a couple of spicy food pros. See if he can try to hurt us. I may have physically winced at those words because I picked up on the waiter noticing my reaction. Are you sure? The chef can really spice them up. I'm sure. She looked at me again, challenging me to be the one to back down. How about you? One hundred percent, I lied. Oh, Gail said to the waiter. And forget the Merlot refill I just requested. I'll skip over to beer, whatever it is that he's having. Even though my own warm beer was three quarters full, I told him I'd like another one. I figured I'd need the extra liquid to wash down the pain from the hot wings. Of course, the waiter said, departing to place our order. That was rather gutsy of her. Ordering messy sauce wings on a first date, and a hot wings throw down at that. This isn't a date, this is a work meeting, and you need to get back home and work on this novel. I shook my head as if that annoying voice was a fly buzzing around me. Are we going to have a hot wings challenge showdown or something, I asked. Gail grinned, and the magical twinkle in her eye set my heart on fire. I knew these wings would be too much for me. But she was already proving to be too much. The smile I was looking at could set a thousand hearts on fire. It was most certainly setting mine in flames. So, this series of books you write, 
these mysteries. What's the main character's name? Maxwell Bronte. Bronte, like the literary sisters? Yeah, exactly. I named him after Emily Bronte. Well, Bronte without those little umlauts over the E. I didn't want to constantly try to find the special characters on my keyboard, so I went with a regular E for my character. Why Emily Bronte? Wuthering Heights was one of the first classic novels I loved reading when I was young. Wait a minute, she said. You're a dude. That's a classic romance novel. It's a classic novel with themes of love, yes, but also theological conceptions of good and evil. It also explores revenge and obsession. It also challenged the Victorian morality of the time. And because it concerned itself with gender, it can be seen as an early feminist text. You are nothing like I'd expected you to be. You as well. So, let's get back to Maxwell Bronte. His name came from Emily Bronte. But where did the character come from? Where did his personality come from? I'm curious to hear how you created this guy. It was my turn to ramp up the storyteller mode as Gail listened to me share the backstory of the character whose novels were responsible for my fame and fortune. I paused when the wings arrived at the table. The chef was able to make something extra hot, extra spicy. He calls these wings his afterburn delight special. I had been able to smell the intensity of whatever hot sauce the chef had come up with well before the wings reached the table, and I was sweating at the very scent of them. Feeling a sneeze coming on, inspired by the spices tingling my nose, I turned my head and let out three sharp, sneezy bursts. This wasn't going to be good. Okay. Gail said, taking a quick drink of her beer. The game is this. Whoever can eat the most wings without first taking a drink, wins. She easily kicked my ass. I was only halfway through chewing my first bite when the overpowering heat of the sauce, intensified by my overly hyper taste buds, forced me to take a sip of my beer. Gail had already polished off her second wing by the time I picked that first wing back up. Really? she said around a mouthful of food. One bite in? Damn, she was even cute when she spoke with food in her mouth. I looked at the smear of hot sauce on her left cheek and wanted to reach out and remove it with the tip of my finger, but I would never make such a bold move like that. Okay, I said. I'll admit it, I'm not into hot food. But you're going at it like a champion. She dropped the third demeated bone into the little basket beside the wing plate and picked up a fourth one. I'm on a roll, she said. Going to see how many of these babies I can polish off before I have to take a drink. You'd better eat up, or they'll be gone before you finish the first one. She snorted a laugh. Again, the snort, like seeing her talk with food in her mouth, was endearing. I loved that she didn't give a shit and bypassed putting on airs of being ladylike. She was authentically herself, and I relished seeing that. There were two separate mini bowls of the blue cheese sauce. I dipped my wing into it, completely smothering it, then took another bite. That made it almost bearable. I drank down most of my beer before finishing the first wing. I drowned the second wing in the blue cheese sauce and took alternating bites of the celery sticks on our plate between wing bites. The experience was painful, but I was extremely hungry and looked forward to the sustenance. I soaked the third wing in my glass of water, diluting much of the hot sauce before taking a bite. Hey, Gail said, her lips now smothered in the hot sauce. I wondered what it would be like to kiss those lips, after they were wiped clean of the hot sauce, of course. That's cheating. I already lost a long time ago. As I watched her continue to work her way through the wings, not once stopping to take a drink, I marveled at this unique woman. She was pushing forth, despite the pain I could sense she was feeling, despite the sweat glistening on her forehead and the fact her nose was running. I knew I should call it a night and get back to my hotel room now that I had what I needed to get past that writer's block. But I couldn't resist spending more time with this woman, even if it was only to see what she did, what she said next. The main entrees came just as she was finishing off the full plate and I was finishing my third wing. I have an idea for this round, I said. No contests. How about we just eat like civilized adults? Hardy har, she said, and took a drink of her beer. 
We both started into the meals in front of us, and it was quiet for about a minute before Gail put her fork down and grinned mischievously at me. For the main entree, we'll recognize the peace treaty. But when the desserts come around, the war is back on, my friend. I laughed, wondering what sort of challenge or throwdown she might have planned for that. But more than that, I was happy to know she was planning on staying for a third course. This was a night I simply did not want to end. And technically, it didn't. Throughout the meal, she continued to inquire about my writing background. When it was time for dessert, the game she wanted to play was us guessing the other one's favorite dessert and ordering it. We tied that round, but it was relatively easy. There were only three items on their menu, apple tartlet, chocolate salted caramel souffle, and mini pumpkin cheesecake. I got her on the souffle, and she pegged me on the cheesecake. Long after the desserts were done, we kept asking for refills on our coffees. Gail told me the story of acquiring the occult shop and managing it with her friend Isabeau. We kept talking, bouncing back and forth between sharing various stories of our lives, and it felt like the entire several hours of that meal took no more than about 15 minutes. Time can be like that when you click with a person, and I felt myself really clicking with Gail. We closed that restaurant down, and the conversation, sharing, joking, and laughing continued between us until they started turning the lights out and putting chairs up on the tables. We finally got the not-so-subtle hints it was time to leave. But instead of saying good night and parting ways, we walked together toward Times Square and the theater district, and then back and forth along the streets as if we were exploring the area and targeting hitting them all like trick-or-treaters trying to maximize our reach across the neighborhood. The next thing I knew, we were still walking and engaged in animated conversation, and the sun was rising in the eastern sky. We had been talking all damn night. That had never happened to me before. By the time we said goodbye, I knew only one thing. This was a woman I wanted to know that I needed to see again. <laughs>